Hey guys, it's Dr. Childs, and today is episode number 24, uh, and we are going to be talking about bad genes and how they impact thyroid function. And so let's just let's just jump in here because it's I'm going to try and make this complicated topic really easy to understand and and really straightforward. And I have a longer blog post if you're interested in more of the nitty gritty that should be coming out um, within a week or so. Um, that you can look at just for more clarification, but uh, let's just let's consider this just an int introduction uh, to that concept. So, genes, your genes, your DNA can impact your thyroid function in a positive or a negative way. Um, and the when we talk about genes, it's important to understand this concept of a SNP, which is um, well, it's actually it's SNP, but people commonly refer to it as SNP, so uh, which is the acronym. But it stands for single nucleotide polymorphism. And what a SNP is is it is a common variation found among individuals, and it's a slight, a very, very, very slight change of a single nucleotide in your DNA. So if you look at these versions, this could be one person, this could be another person, this could be, you know, let's just say there's four different people. And if we took their DNA and we looked at it and we unraveled it and spun it all out, we would find that it's very similar, you know, 99% of the time. Like almost almost every single every single nucleotide is the same with few exceptions in certain places. And these small changes are called SNPs. And so what they do is big changes in your genes impact you in a very negative way. Okay, so if you're just like cut out a portion of your DNA, that's going to be a big problem. But if you just swap one nucleotide for let's say an enzyme, that doesn't make the entire enzyme inactive, although it could. Usually it just changes the way that it functions slightly. And this could be a good change or it can be a bad change. And so what science is interested in doing is looking at these specific changes in nucleotides and determining how they impact disease, right? So if, if I could say, okay, hey, so in version two, if you have a C here instead of an A, that's a good thing because now your your enzymes work better. But if you have a G here, then that's a bad thing because it's 30% you know, decrease in function because of that. But if you have a T there, it's even worse. It's 70% in, increase in function or decrease in function. So then we say to ourselves, okay, well, what if we could test everybody and if we could identify people who have these SNPs, then we could focus our treatment because we could say, well, this person is almost the same, but you know, this person has it bad and this person has it worse, and then we could alter our treatment. And this concept goes for how well people respond to supplements, how they respond to medications, the symptoms that they may experience, their, their susceptibility to disease states, and so on. So that's a really brief introduction to what these SNPs are. So let's talk about it um, in terms of um, your thyroid, okay? So the, this particular this primarily affects your thyroid because these SNPs impact certain enzymes which are responsible for regulating your thyroid hormone in your body and regulating thyroid metabolism. And these enzymes are called deiodinases. Okay, it's kind of a big word, but whatever. Um, you know, I'll explain this in a simple way. So there's basically three main deiodinases deiodinases that we're interested in: D1, D2, and D3. And so some of these are depicted here, so D1, D2, D3. Don't let this image confuse you. I'm just showing it to you so that so that you have some idea of what we're talking about. Um, I'm trying to zoom in there. Um, and so what, what you need to get from this picture is that these enzymes are in different tissues. And that's a good thing because what they allow your body to do is say, hey, we're getting too much thyroid hormone in your, in your muscles, so we need to inactivate that because we need more in your brain. Um, because you're thinking right now, you're not running. But if you're running, the same might be true. So your brain says, oh, wait a minute, I know he's, I know this, he or she is exercising. So we need now more thyroid hormone in the muscle tissues as opposed to the brain. So let's decrease it in the brain, let's increase it in the muscles. Then likewise, these enzymes might say, well, hey, hold on a second. The thyroid isn't producing enough thyroid hormone. This person has Hashimoto's or hypothyroidism. And so what, what it then does is it says, hold on, we have to kick up the, the active hormone in the cell because the body isn't producing enough for us. And so in this way, your deiodinases, they primarily are responsible for the activation or inactivation of thyroid hormone in each and every one of your cells. And I think because of this, and, and the more I read and understand, I think they're more important than your absolute free thyroid hormone levels in your body. And I think this is part of the reason that explains how some people can have normal free thyroid levels, a normal TSH, but still be cellularly hypothyroid. All right, so it's because of these things, it's because of these deiodinases. Okay, so that's that's the general idea. I'm going to give you some brief um, stats about these guys too. So D1 is considered an activating deiodinase or an activating enzyme. So what it does is it takes your T4 and it turns it into T3. 
So you can see D1 in this image. So T4 goes here, um, um, D1 hits it, and it turns it into T3. Boom. Good. We want that. Okay. It's an activating deionase. D2, same thing. It's an activating deionase. So they're in different tissues, but they still do the same thing. So T4 comes, it hits D2, boom, turns into T3. Perfect. We want that. Okay. So now in normal situations, about 30% of the free T3 that's floating around in your blood um, is is uh, accomplished through the deionase of, or through the activity of D1. Okay, so 30% of T4 turns into to T3 because of D1. Now, so that's a that's a good amount, but the majority is done through D2. So this guy, so 70% of the the T3 that's in circulation um, was turned into T3 because of D2. All right, so these are the big players here. D1 does 30%, D2 does 70%. D3 is considered the inactivating enzyme. So if D3, if T4 hits D3, so you can see here, T4 will follow the line, boom, hits D3, what does it turn into? RT3 or T2? Okay, so reverse T, that's RT3, that's reverse T3. And T2 is, it's a kind of active metabolite, but not a big one, okay? So what that means is that these enzymes are constantly at play, you know, uh, activating or inactivating certain tissues and, and thyroid hormone in the tissues. Now, what, what the problem is, is that certain SNPs affect the how well these guys work. Okay, and so what we're primarily interested in is the guys who affect D2. Because let's say, so we said before, 70% of the amount of T3 that's in your in your blood um, was turned into T3 because of D2. But what if D2 only works at 50% because you have a SNP? Oh, well, that's a problem because now instead of producing 70%, now it produce, produces 35%. So now you're already at a disadvantage when it comes to producing T3 in your bloodstream. Just because of this single nucleotide polymorphism. All right, that one little change could impact that enzyme. Likewise, it might make it a super, you know, you might become a, a super converter. So um, that one change could make it activate and, and turn all T4 into T3. And instead of responsible for, for 70%, it might be responsible for 95% because it's just that active. All right, and this is how some people respond differently to different thyroid medications. So if you're a super activator, I'll just give you a bunch of T4 all day and your body will just chew through it and churn out tons of T3. You're totally fine. But what if, you are you have a SNP that impacts and reduces D2, which means that you're going to be less responsive to T4 medication. And wouldn't it be nice if we had studies which show that this is the case? And of course, we have tons of them, actually. It's, it's, re, it's a really interesting um, and emerging um, science that, that's occurring here. And so uh, I just want to give you an introduction to it. But this is essentially how it works. And so these enzymes, if we can test for them, which we can, we can determine how well or how likely you are to respond to certain thyroid medications. So if I if I look at your SNPs, like let's say before you before you're even diagnosed, I say, well, let's get a 23 and me on you, and let's look at all the SNPs in your body, and we run it, and then we look at this, and we like we, we before you even get a disease, we can look at it and be like, well, look, you know, Jane or whatever, Jane is has a, a propensity for developing you know, whatever, X, these diseases, and if she gets hypothyroidism, then she's probably not going to be very responsive to T4 medication. And so right off the bat, before you even get anything, if you develop it, we know how to treat you. And so that's the value of this, uh, of, of checking for these SNPs and how they impact um, your thyroid. And I think what we're going to find over probably the next five to 10 years is that these deionases are way more important than your TSH and your free T3 and your free T4 because of how active they are. So the best way to, to look for this would either, well, our, our best way right now is just to look for SNPs that you have in your in your blood or in, in your DNA and then kind of uh, figure out how that would impact the thyroid medication you take. So that's what we're working on right now. However, if there was a test that exists in the future which could um, evaluate the relative activity of these enzymes, that would probably be the best way. But short of sampling each and every tissue or cell in your body, we don't have the ability to do that. And so anyway, that's sort of an introduction here. I didn't even get into the treatment. Um, I thought I thought I'd be able to get into some of those things, but I don't want this to go on forever. Um, so that's an introduction to to this concept. And I think I have an even easier picture. I don't know if that's easier or not for <laughs> we'll talk about that later. But but anyway, so I just wanted to introduce this to you guys, let you know that these deionases play a very important role in regulating your thyroid um, and your genes can impact them. So now I want to hear from you guys. Have you had your genes tested? Uh, what questions do you have about these deionases? Uh, things like that. So let me know if you have any questions, leave them in the comments below and I will do my best to answer them. Otherwise, I will see you guys in the next one.